Hi everybody, it's Nathan Cool with Swell Watch on SurfingMagazine.com. It's the last day of the year and it's about time for another El Nino report. We've known this year that no two El Ninos are alike and that's proof of it by a lot of the stuff that we've seen. A lot of stuff's already happened from El Nino. It was one, overhyped uh, a lot, or maybe not overhyped, but the one thing was it definitely made the news. I uh, got a lot of different monikers this year, uh, including uh, mythical creatures, but uh, it's a real serious event. And so I wanted to get you recapped on what has happened, what's about to happen, what's happening actually in the short term but some surprising twists, and not to sound like clickbait, but there are some surprising twists on what's actually happening. A few things we've seen already. We've seen a lot of snowpack already that's fallen in the Sierras. That came early. We saw some strange storms come through Southern California, even though we had some very strong surf, in fact, some epic swell that actually had damaged the Ventura Pier, something that we hadn't seen since January 30th, 1998. So we have a very strong El Nino going on. There's definitely some changes to it. I want to show you a little bit of the science behind why it's not just the surface temperatures that matter, but it's also the depth of what we're talking about. And there's very different temperature readings that are coming across this year compared to other years, despite what you might have actually seen in the news, because they didn't actually tell the full story. That's where I want to come in. I want to show you exactly what's going on, what's happening. Let's take a look at what's going on right now. So the first thing I wanted to cover was the fact that El Nino has peaked. And we can see that we're in, uh, going into January 2016, but even prior to that, the temperature started declining. We can see that all the models are in agreement on this. Even the last uh, model plume uh, forecast you can see from November, that's the observation that was actually made where it definitely peaked. It was very high, the El Nino signal. And as we get into the November, December, January, December, January, February timeframe, all the models show that El Nino would decline. Some outlier over here is saying that, oh, it might go back up again toward the end of late uh, 2016, but that's kind of doubtful. Either way, we're seeing that everything basically has peaked. It doesn't mean that we're not gonna see a very active winter, but it means that that signal that was across the equatorial Pacific on the sea surface temperatures has basically peaked. And we can see that across all the zones of the equatorial region where all of this is measured. What got everybody's attention though recently, and of course it was great for headlines, was that this was the strongest El Nino ever on record. That's if you take into consideration one reading that comes off of the El Nino, uh, the NSO 3.4 region. You can take a look at my last video, uh, the update six, which showed uh, what that region is and what that actually means. We can see though here, the red 2015, it did become very strong, extremely strong signal, and we paralleled very closely to the 1997 event. Right now where we are though, things are pretty well leveled off. So with that in mind, when we take a look at the three month mean, well, what does that actually mean? When we take a look at three months combined together, and we take an average, we can see that 97 in red here was very high, 1982 also was, and 2015 falls in line with those. Now bear in mind we don't have the three month mean yet for what just happened out of that recent peak. So we don't have that yet to actually put into it, but since it was temporary and we take three month uh, mean into consideration, it's probably not going to really elevate that uh, signal that much more. It will be higher, but remember this is climate, it's not weather, it's affecting things for a longer term. That means it has a longer term to actually grow and have some type of an effect on us. It's climate, definitely not weather. Another thing that's happened recently, the PDO signal has dropped off. So the same thing happened in 1997, you can see here in red, 2015 in, uh, in yellow. And that's not uncommon to actually happen. PDO, as you might recall from prior videos I've put together, is that uh, it is kind of El Nino's bigger brother. So seeing the El Nino uh, kind of start to wane, we're seeing the PDO wane, it's not that much different than what happened about this time in 1997. But there is something that's very, very different. So one of the things that have been read recently, and when we take a look at all these readings, we start seeing the uh, sea surface temperatures. That's what everybody's referring to, um, and especially that peak that we saw uh, recently in the ENSO 3.4 region. But it's also the depth of the heat that matters. And so in, this is a nice diagram that NASA put together and it shows what 1997 looked like across the equator. We can see that the temperatures were very warm at a very low depth, and of course that's what's happening right now, but it's a matter of if you were to take an average of going down from the surface to about 300 meters, what is that average temperature? So when we take a look at comparing that, NASA hasn't put together a recent image to give a visual comparison so far from this year, maybe they would be nice, but I put together a chart, and it shows then the three strong El Nino years, the, what we have right now, 1987, 1982. 
So take a look at 1997, and we can see that 1997, when you average the uh, what's known as the upper ocean heat content anomaly at the 300 meter depth, it was very high. It was very strong. It was a very deep El Nino. Not just the sea surface temperatures, but the depth was very warm. So was 1982, shown here in blue. When we get out of 2015, it was warm, but it wasn't warm like the others. So when we talk about this being the strongest El Nino ever, yes, it did have sea surface temperatures that were very high, but some of its staying power, some of its depth, just wasn't there. So where are we right now? Well, visually, if we take a look at it, we can still see very much an El Nino going on. We've got this long red tongue coming off of the equatorial Pacific, off of uh, Ecuador, Peru region. So we've got uh, a very strong El Nino going on. You can see this was from December 28th, 2015. But there's also still this uh, Northeast Pacific warm anomaly, what people were calling the blob uh, earlier in the year. And that's a lot different than what we had in 1997. So this is a model from 1997. Uh, it was uh, December 27th, actually. And the El Nino signal was very strong, very strong off here, but it was also a lot of cold water. And remember, our weather across the planet is driven by deltas. It's driven by a difference in temperatures. A difference in temperature means a difference in pressure. Difference in pressure means also then a wind that's associated with it. And a lot of things then form off that. So that's the impetus to everything when it has to come to uh, climate and weather. So when we take a look at the big comparison between 1997 and 1998 at the top, and we take a look then at 2014 to 2015 on the ocean temperature index shown here, we see large differences, big differences. So up here at the top on 97-98, very strong El Nino signal that was right off of the, uh, the, the coast of uh, Peru, Ecuador. Very cold water, still up here to the north. Look at 2014-2015. I mean, this looks like a monster system. You've got so much warm water, but the thing is, there wasn't a great difference between what we really had going across the equatorial Pacific and what was in the Northeast Pacific. So that has a big role to play in how the uh, world circulates its atmosphere, the weather patterns. This is something just real quick, you can find this off Wikipedia, um, when it talks about Hadley cells. And Hadley cells, the upper atmospheric cells that are circulating things from uh, certain uh, latitudes down to other latitudes, basically from the basic concept of it and also something known as Rossby waves going the other direction, which actually then can have an effect on the jet stream. In short, when you combine the two together, and not to get into those two in very good de in much detail, is to really concentrate more on this, <clears throat> excuse me, something known as the atmospheric bridge, or Rossby transport, it's also known as. Basically, we have El Nino warm waters, and yes, we, we've all gauged that. We've got the statistics based off of it, but where the rubber meets the road is, hey, you've got this warm water off of here that's going to have an effect on this deep and dilution low up here, and that low pressure then affects everything else that we're talking about. If you've got a difference in temperature, though, across hemispheres or across large portions of the planet anywhere, then, of course, that atmospheric bridge is going to be different. So let's take a look, though, at what's happening right now and how that's being affected. This is great news, taking a look at a model like this. This is from NOAA. This is a precipitation model, and in the little red L's here, those are low pressure. You can see that now, unlike so many years prior that caused our drought in Southern California, and most of the California actually in the West, is that we now have low pressure here. We don't have high pressure that was dominating that. So low pressure, spinning counterclockwise, this is great news. That means that storms can come in to drive from the Western Pacific across and eventually reach California. So that has an effect on the jet stream. But as we see here, it might have an effect that we didn't really expect. Something I mentioned a few reports back is that, yeah, we want to have that uh, jet stream lower in latitude, drive storms towards Southern California. But as you can see here on this projection that was run this morning by FNMOC, uh, similar to other recent projections over the last couple days, the jet stream driving some storms would actually go over Baja. Storms come out of the Western Pacific, follow this jet stream, and they would miss us. They'd go too far to the south. In other words, to have El Nino's benefit, you have to be in a Goldilocks zone to, for that jet stream to be at just the right latitude to affect you. We can see how it's having that negative effect with the next couple storms coming towards Southern California. And this may look like a very dotted up, confusing model, but basically this is Southern California, right in this area here. This blob below it, that's vorticity, and that's coming off a low pressure system that's about to head right into Baja and not Southern California. We can see it on a precipitation model here. 
So rain uh, expected for uh, early next week in Southern California is going to actually go more toward Baja at first. And that's from that jet stream dropping it down. You can see a much stronger system coming in behind it. <clears throat> and that stronger system has a larger rain band. This green here, this is precipitation. So we can see a lot of precipitation still headed to the west coast. And because the weather front on this, and it's such a large system, we're going to get some rain out of it by the middle of next week. It's also a very large system pumping up a lot of winds. And along those winds, we create waves. And those waves, we've got some very impressive swell on the forecast. So when we take a look at surf heading towards Southern California, the way that El Nino is forming right now, yes, that jet stream is driving storms farther south. So before they drive south, they're actually building up a lot of swell along the way. So these are uh, sea heights here, and great FN Mach model uh, for, for gauging uh, the heights of waves and, and then judging the timing for swell and whatnot. We can see here, this red blob here, that's about 25 foot seas. Southern California's here. This thing's just almost right on shore. It's very, very close to us. The same thing's going to happen with the next few storms that we've got lined up over here, heading toward the, the west coast. Once again, coming across the jet stream, being guided toward our area. So a lot of surf headed our way. We've got uh, the jet stream lined up where we'd like it to have it for swell. This is ideal to go ahead and send a lot of swell our way. But the problem is to get precipitation out of it, we need to have those storms ride at a little bit of a higher latitude. And of course, having such a strong El Nino signal, could it mean then that for the rest of the season, we have more of a pattern like this than having the latitude, just uh, the jet stream at just a slightly higher latitude, which would then benefit more rain for our area. So that's what we're up against right now. Well, that's about all that I've got right now. So that's kind of where El Nino is. We see uh, a lot of stuff happening. We know that a lot of stuff is still about to happen and some very uh, bizarre changes that have happened this year. The, the jet stream being at that southerly latitude, it means we might not get as much snow up in the Sierras. We did get some snow up in the Sierras in the beginning of December and that was great. But now if that jet stream goes too far to the south and leaves our Goldilocks zone, well, that's bad news for getting more snowpack, which isn't just for the skiers, it also means that we'd get out of the drought as well. We need a lot of snowpack, not just rain. It also means though that we'd see a lot of heavy swell that, that would come our way. The, the swells coming across, they'd be unabated, uh, coming across the, uh, the latitudes of the Northern Pacific. So we could see some very, very heavy surf. The rain out of it for Southern California, that then becomes questionable too because some of it could go over Baja, not so much over Southern California. We've got to stay in that Goldilocks zone and see what happens. So there's a lot still that needs to be tracked over the coming weeks, over the coming months, but this is what it's looking like right now. Heavy surf, definitely for the coming weeks and probably in through the re remainder of January and definitely well into February. Not just statistically speaking, but also what we're seeing through observations. The amount of rain for Southern California now comes into question. It it could be actually higher over uh, Mexico than what it is over Southern California. Snowpack could also start to diminish by the looks of things right now. Still a lot to keep an eye on. I'm going to keep you posted as best I can. If you want to keep uh, up to date on videos like this, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's free, won't cost you anything, and as soon as new videos like this are posted, you'll be notified. You can also follow me on my forecasts on Surfing Magazine. They're at forecasts.surfingmagazine.com. I concentrate on Southern California. Also, if you want to follow me on Facebook, every once in a while I have an update there as well. Sometimes it's just hard to get all these other things posted, so sometimes a quick Facebook post could keep you up to date on what's happening. You can follow me at facebook.com slash Nathan Todd Cool. Well, that's all I've got for now. Thanks for watching, and until next time, take care, be safe, and smile in the lineup.